the Author to Author podcast series with award-winning author Pamela R. Haynes. Welcome to the podcast. Dalgetty Herbal Teas produce 100% natural high-quality organic teas using only the best ingredients. Available now from all major supermarkets or please visit our website at dalgetty.co. Dalgetty Herbal Teas. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening and good night. My name is Pamela R. Haynes, award-winning author of Loving the Brothers. I'm going to keep things very brief today because we have a phenomenal author coming up to talk about her life, her books and her publishing company. The lovely people at Dalgetty Teas have given us a discount code, especially for this series. And the code is A2AS2 which gives you 10% off of your next Dalgetty tea order. Listen very carefully to the podcast so that you can enter the author to author competition. And today we are giving away not one, but two copies of 36 Weeks Life Behind the School Gates written by Jules Bremner. I thoroughly enjoyed interviewing Juliet Coley and I hope you enjoyed the episode too. See you on the other side. And hello there, Juliet. Thank you so much for joining me on the Author to Author podcast. You are very welcome, Pamela. Good, good. Where are you in the world now and what country are you representing today? Oh, gosh, I'm in the New Republic. I'm in Barbados. It is so beautiful out here. Yeah, so I'm representing Barbados. We, I'm from Jamaican heritage. My That's mother right. and father are Jamaican. My uncle married a beautiful Bayesian lady and decided that he was coming here to live and um, last year before you know while the pandemic was in its its craziness because I had underlying health issues I decided that I was going to pick up my bags and I came for five months and then this year with the new version of the virus I thought do you know what you know England's not holding me and it's like a kind of this place, Barbados, is just such a beautiful place to reflect, to think, even to work because of the time difference and stuff. It feels like I get more done in a day. I'm a Christian and we used to sing a song called Be Still and Know That I Am God. I can sit on Miami Beach. I can That's sit true. on Brown Beach and just be still and actually hear God speaking. I don't hear it in London because I'm always boom, 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 here, there and everywhere. But when I'm here, I do. And I also kind of feel when I wake up in the morning, the sun is shining through the windows, the cock is crowing or the monkeys are running along the (laughs) the wall. It's like, why do we live in the cold? Why did my mum not go back to the Caribbean? You know, I don't I don't get it because I I flourish more. I'm much more creative, you know, when the sun is is beaming down. So, yeah, certainly a good place to sit and reflect. You mentioned one of my favourite beaches as well, Miami Beach, and um, Mm. the waves just crashing in there, the noise of the children playing. um, Mm. You know, I can just, I can just, I'm there with you. I'm there on the beach (laughs) with you. And I can see why it's such a creative place for you to to be in. Um, Mm. So you're an honorary Bajan then? Oh, I hope so. I hope so. When I came over here, we, I worked on a, a project called Bajan ABC. I wanted to do a Caribbean ABC series. I'm a publisher. I publish children uh, authors or children writers. And I found a 10 year old who is of Bayesian heritage, her mum and her uh, gran and, you know, all all live in Barbados and worked with her on the alphabet and to find, you know, 26 Bayesian words. And um, so we did have, you know, C was for crop over. Even R was for Rihanna. But we still had, you know, Animal Flower Cave. We still had Harris, you know, Harrison's cave and stuff. So we ended up doing that. And then from there, we've got a Jamaican ABC now and we publish it this week. We're releasing this week, a Trinidad and Tobago ABC to oh, wow. keep that oh, wow. going. So yeah. Well, congratulations on all of that. And we are going to talk about um, uh, Blackjack Media during this interview mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. But Barbados just had their elections. Were you, you were there in Barbados? Yes, in it was. Time? Yes, I was here. I saw all the, the posters are up on the, um, <laughs> on the posts or the, you know, the posts that hold the telephone wires and stuff like that. Yeah. Very calm, very calm. Obviously landslide. 
Mia, we love her, you know. I mean, last year when I was here, every week she'd do a broadcast, you know, to, to the Islanders. And it was just such a warm person. Obviously, people in the chat would say all different sorts of things and stuff like that. But she was such a warm person and a great and an inspirational leader as a woman, as well as a Caribbean woman. Inspirational as well for me. Lovely. Well, I'm delighted to know that she selected her cabinet and 26% of her cabinet members are women as well. So not only do we have a woman who is prime minister, we also have a woman who is deputy prime minister as mm-hmm. well. Mm-hmm. And they're taking up some really heavy duty portfolios in Barbados as well. So it will be wonderful to see how all of that unfolds um, in the hands of women so we'll see you know it's so beautiful and I I think I'm so glad that my uncle you know married a beige woman because I probably wouldn't have ever traveled to Barbados and I remember growing up in the 70s you know it was like the only island that exists was Jamaica and everybody was Jamaican even the Africans would say oh I'm from Jamaica because it was like wearing a little badge of honor a couple of years ago I went to Antigua the sand in Antigua. You know, I love Jamaica. I'm I'm of Jamaican heritage, but there are so many other beautiful places. I'm I'm glad that I've had the chance to experience this. So yeah, five months is not uh, is not a holiday. Five months. You might as well say that you lived there. I, I do agree with you that every island has its uniqueness. You know, I've been to Jamaica twice now. Once to Montego Bay, and the second time to Ochi Rios. And they mm. both have unique things that, they, you know, mm. the greenery mm. and scenery that they offer as well. Um, mm. I do remember traveling to North Africa. And my friend had a Dominican passport, so she got hauled over by immigration. And they kept on asking her, where is Dominica? They hadn't heard oh of it. So they got the map of the world out and um, said, where is Dominica? So she pointed to this little dot and they said, oh, Apri, Jamaica, Bob Marley. No problem. No. Go through. <laughs> so, um, in terms of, you know, relating to what you say about back in the day, um, a lot of people only remember Jamaica and not mm. acknowledging mm. that there are other mm. islands as well. Knowing that I came from Jamaica, back in the 70s, when I watched TV, it was shantytown. There were corrugated iron roofs. That is yeah. the perspective I had of Jamaica until I actually, I think I was about 26, and first, you know, went there. And there's a loads of, obviously, expats there building their houses and stuff like that. And it was like, oh, my God, they've got satellite TVs. They've got this. The... And me, as a product of a, of a Jamaican family, shocked to see that Jamaica was in the, the, it was, you know, actually a a, a proper island. So really and truly, you know, with me and the books and the legacy that we're trying to promote, we are trying to show, you know, or get rid of those lies, the beauty of these places, you know, and and encourage Caribbean heritage so that it lives on. I want to set the scene for our listeners. So I would have been 20 years old with my wet look. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, I, you know, a born again Christian and mm. people get ready was it was just something else. It was such a phenomenon at the you know, at the time to see black faces on television in their mass in front of the camera and behind the camera and presenting the show as well. It was unbelievable. I mean, so our paths first crossed then mm. because I was in the um, Angelical Voice Choir. And um, we were selected as one of the choirs to take part in the show. But tell our listeners how that all came about. Okay, so I was blessed to have got or blagged myself a job at The Voice newspaper back when it had first started. So I was one of the original, not the originals, but the next generation after the originals. And basically, I moved, The Voice started in Hackney and then it moved to a place called Bow Road. And um, I was at Bow Road and I was offered a job by a guy called Viv Broughton. Viv Broughton wrote Black Gospel. Great guy. And my first job there was actually stuffing envelopes. They didn't have any vacancies or anything. I said, I'll do anything, blah, blah, blah. But my mum had always said to me, whatever you do, make sure that you do it with pride. Do it to the best of your ability. So those envelopes that I stuffed with videos at the time were pristine. I typed the labels and did what I did, blah, blah, blah. At the time, I was a Christian. I was into drama. You know, I'd got a great grade in my drama. And I just felt led, the Lord was leading me into doing performance. And 
at that time, that wasn't the way the church was going. You know, at the, time, at the time when I was in church, you know, you weren't allowed to wear earrings, you couldn't wear trousers, you know, women were seen and not heard, even though my pastor was a female I.O. Smith legend and my grandmother was her assistant at the NTA. But they didn't, they couldn't get this whole thing about drama in the church. So I ended up doing it in prisons with, I set up a drama company called Acid, the Association of Christians and Dramatics. And I used to do it in prisons when they had concerts, we'd perform with LCGC and, and, and so forth. And just did it because we wanted to spread the gospel in a different form. And we got a lot of backlash for it. But I kind of felt that God was leading me in that direction. So I just ignored what was going on. And while I was at The Voice, a woman came to visit The Voice and said that she was from Television South. She heard The Voice had a page called Soul Stirrings and that she wanted, uh, or her company TBS wanted to commission a black gospel program. The first of its kind, never been done before. We're going back into the 80s now, because right. even then there weren't many black people still on television. Cut a long story short. I recommended John Francis. I thought that he was amazing. He had the inspirational choir going and she went to visit him and saw him and straight away picked him as one of the presenters of the show. As she was going on and going around now meeting all these soft gospel people, my name had been coming up because of the drama that I was doing in the church and stuff. So she came back to me probably a couple months later and said, you know, why didn't you tell me you did drama? And I said, oh, I it's just what I do, whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, she said, I want you to be one of the presenters on People Get Ready. And it was like, well, it wasn't called People Get Ready at the time. It didn't have a name. And it was like, wow, okay. But at 21, or probably 20 still then, you know, to be, to be asked to do this, I didn't really realise how massive it was. I didn't realise how big it was. And because I was doing it and it was church and stuff, it was like... I was doing what God wanted me to do. It wasn't like, I'm on TV, you know, I'm a host of a TV show. So I kind of didn't take it as seriously as I probably could have and then kind of move forward. But when I was doing it, I didn't like the way that I was being told to present. Come on, lively, lively, da 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 da, da. You know, and so I ended up being lively, my hands were all over the place, really excited. So the first season of People Get Ready, I hate it. And I actually said to them, I don't want to do it again. You know, I don't like it. You know, I can't even watch the videos. It's um, cr cringing and whatever. But by the second season, and I'd settled in, I could say, nope, I'm not wearing that. Nope, I'm not saying that. Nope, 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 and whatever, and got more comfortable. And it, interestingly, it ran from like 86 right to 92. So it had a good span. So in terms Absolutely. of what we were doing... We were actually, you know, breaking grounds for the black community, but never really realized it at the time. It was just something that I did. And because it was church and what you did for God was just what you did for God and never really viewed it as it was. And in the end, I mean, I'm probably 30 odd years on. Um, we just did a, po a podcast, did a podcast last year and just talking about the program and things like that and not realizing how many people it actually impacted, you know, how many, much people love the show and what you did made that little difference. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what I liked about it and having had the experience of actually being in the studio as mm. well, it didn't feel as though we were play acting, that we were pretending to be in church. It was just no, what it was. And, you know, the for me to be able to say that I got to sing alongside you know, these great artists that you were able to bring over, yeah. some from the States, Same. you know, Tremaine yeah. Hawkins yeah. and so yeah. on. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it just felt like you had brought church into the studio. So um, I'm sure that um, I've got a copy of People Get Ready on VCR somewhere that, <laughs> you know, that I can dig out and show show the grandchildren. But it was a show that changed the face of what, TV, what was happening on TV yeah, I, at I the think, time. I think John played a big part in that because John was that preacher you know that that little little David destined to be you know big King David and whatever but he had that something about him that anointing I should say not even something about him that allowed him to be himself wherever he was which is what made, made people get ready quite unique I mean as you said we we're meeting big top American stars Thomas Whitfield you know Tremaine Hawkins who sang Happy Day and it was like Nothing is like normal, if that makes sense. I know that if I know back then what I know now, obviously social media wasn't around then, you know, everything was yes. much different. 
if I knew back then what I know now, maybe things might have been different for me in terms of my career and stuff. I know that whatever I've done anywhere, I'm satisfied with. I know that God's brought me here for a reason, a purpose. But if you knew back then what you actually were doing then, you know, because at that time there was things like No Problem, the comedy series right. on. There was probably Club Mix that was on, but not many. I mean, I, I know in the 70s we would ring each other and say, Black people on TV, you know, or whatever. We, there were more but not as much as they should have been. So I, I feel proud to be one of the ground breakers, really. And, and the thing is, before I got sick, my children didn't even know I was on TV. It was only when I got sick and we're doing a clear out, as you do, you know, doing a clear out, my son was saying, what's this? What's this one? What's this as a video? And what is on it? Yeah. And when I, yeah. you know, when I, I had a VCR at the time still and I played it, they were like, oh my God, mum. So it was, it was just something that we just did to, to kind of spread the gospel. So, yeah. Yeah, I Happy mean, absolutely. Day. I do think that nothing has come close. And you certainly set the bar really, really high for those who are coming after, you know, coming after you in terms of wanting gospel to be on our screens. You must be very proud of your involvement with the show. But tell absolutely. us what happened when the show when the show ended. The show ended, I was still, but the show ended because they lost their franchise. So every 10 years, you know, the companies go up for and bid for the channels and stuff. And at that time, TVS lost their franchise to Meridian. And yeah. we used to have Thames Television in London and they lost their franchise to ITV. So TVS decided to bury the programmes with them and they weren't going to give them over. So it ended. I was still at The Voice at the time. I'd then gone on to write Soul Stirrings then gone on to, it was too much with my workload and then recommended Marcy Dixon because Marcy Dixon was actually um, a receptionist at The Voice. I, she was at university oh, wow. and I gave, it, uh, I gave her name to the people saying, my friend will do it. So she then ended up being receptionist at The Voice and then moved on to do Soul Stirrings and, as, and brought it to the fantastic place it is today. Being at The Voice, I, it made me realise I was black because the stories were black. You know, I was doing stuff in the community. I was going to the carnivals. I was doing this and I was doing that. And, you know, Stephen Lawrence had been murdered, you know, but before him, Roland Adams had been murdered. So if, if they'd have um, taken Roland Adams's situation seriously, maybe Stephen Lawrence would have been murdered, wouldn't have been murdered. All these stories that were coming in on a daily basis really made me realise that I am black and what can I do? What can I do for my community? And that really kind of set my kind of moral compass in the way that I operated. And at that time as well, there was a massive thing about black boys and underachievement. And um, the Afro-Caribbean boys in particular were not doing well in education. It would grieve me. And I was thinking, if I have kids and I have a boy, this can't happen. And it grieved me so much to the point where I said, you know what, I'm going to be a teacher. I'm going to be a teacher and I'm going to change the world. And even walking out of, of something like The Voice, you know what I mean, and going into education, it was like, going backwards, no money. Well, I had a bit of money, but no proper income coming in because I'd yes. gone to study at university. And then I decided to do the PGCE. And then I did it in a school in Tottenham. And they were so happy with me at that time, talking about late, probably late 90s, 98, around that time. They were so happy at the time. They offered me a job before I finished my university placement. And oh, wow. I just felt that school was where I wanted to be. It was heart of Tottenham, bordered Hackney, you know, the kids were, were failing dramatically and I wanted to make that difference. I qualified as an English teacher as well as teaching media and I felt like I wanted to do English because English was that core subject. I want to make Shakespeare relevant. I wanted these kids to pass their exams and stuff and I ended up at that school for 20 years and oh, I stayed wow. at that school for 20 years and I started off as a newly qualified, well a beginner teacher, then a newly qualified teacher then in my first year, I was made deputy head of year. Then the following year, I was made head of year, where you look after 240 kids and bring them through from years seven to 11. Right. And then I was made assistant head, deputy head, senior deputy head, and then I retired due to ill health. But in that time, the school was Ofsted outstanding three times in a row, and I led on Ofsted. The, the children that came out of that school, the things that they did, you know, I remember a, a year seven boy called Ricky, that was always naughty, always school school day, and I, you know, detention, detention. He goes, ah, oh, you hate me, Miss. You know, I looked on um, social media. He's a chief cardiovascular surgeon at the Royal Brompton Hospital. 
Chipmunk is um, was a number one rapper in the charts. He was our head boy. Emmanuel Fringpong played for Arsenal. I've got three students that I taught that are PhD graduates from Oxford. One of the kids that I taught, he said to me, he used to bang on the tables all the time because he uh, loved music and loved beats. And when I bumped into him, I asked him what he's doing. He told me that he just produced and wrote a song for Drake. Oh, sold wow. millions of copies. And this is somebody that I taught. So being a teacher and impacting, you know, lives of, of children has been my greatest joy, to be honest with you. One of my greatest joys. What an incredible career then that spans over 20 years. And isn't it good that you're able to track your students? You know, no doubt oh, they come yeah. back to you as well and say to you, Miss, remember me and you know what was happening for them at the time Absolutely. and then to see their successes at the other end is really commendable oh god it's amazing it's amazing they all have it in them you know and I, I was blessed to be in a school that where the head teacher allowed me and the senior leaders to have our way do what to do one of the projects that I did after the riots the 2011 riots that started in Tottenham when I went back to school in the September the kids were saying they don't want to write Tottenham on their application forms because People won't will reject them, you know, and then we came up with a project and we worked with Nicky Brown from People Get Ready. He was a music director yes. and did a song for Tottenham and Governor B actually was on this project and stuff. And we recorded this song for Tot- Tottenham. There was a guy called Dave Stewart who used to sing for the, a group called The Rhythmics, famous, big, massive group. He mm-hmm. heard the song. He said, send me the files. I want to mix it in my studio for free. He mixed it in his studio for free. The kids sang all over you know, all over this song called Everybody Dreams that got to number 38 in the iTunes charts. Little bitty school in Tottenham that is making marks. That experience for those children that took part in it, we had at least 100 children take part in this project, has changed their lives. They know that that they can do something and make a difference to their community. Boris Johnson at the time was mayor of London and came down to the school to tell the children, well done. You know, David Lammy, came and whatever they had that experience some of the kids who took part in the project ended up going to the Brit school and studying singing Mm -hmm. and music as a career so yeah you know being a teacher has been pretty amazing because you know when these children come in they come in from primary school and they have the potential and somehow some way it's knocked out of them I don't sit on that narrative of young black boys being in gangs and being in this and being that, because there is so many positive stories that that way surpass any of the negative that we have. I'm not going to sit on that. I'm not going to sit on that because I've worked in 20 years with over 15, 20,000 children in different capacities and in different ways. And the majority of those, and I'm talking 80% upwards, are amazing and are doing incredible things and if you give them that opportunity and you give them that chance you will see greatness you know we all remember that one teacher that made a difference at school so imagine if that's replicated and you have more than one teacher you have a senior management board that also believe in the students what a difference that can make going forward so um, yeah I commend you for that absolutely I actually wrote about my one teacher in my book, 39 Weeks, and I tried to track her down. And I saw someone on Facebook that looked like it could be her daughter, the name, you know, the background and whatever. And I posted my book to this uh, daughter and said, you don't know me, but I think your mum was my teacher and she changed my life. Can you give her this book if it is her and turn to page, blah, blah, blah. And then about four weeks later, I got a call and it was, Juliet Coley, it's Miss Bell. And it's like, And I found my teacher that 45 years ago, 45 years ago, was my tutor. And she actually came to my retirement do. So my tutor, you know, Miss Bell, lovely, black, gorgeous woman who I always felt was picking on me, but said to me, I see greatness in you. This is why I am on you, Juliet. I found her and I said, Miss, you know. So there is that story that everybody has a great teacher. I'm sure that somebody has inspired somebody. And I'm glad to be part of that group of people. You That's know. wonderful. Because not only do they inspire you, you inspire them. Children inspire you. And that's what I've had. Absolutely. I mean, just having 
parents evening last week and um you know for the first time realizing that you know I'm sitting next to a genius you know who the school certainly believe that they have every potential to go on and it's it's wonderful to hear when people can give you positive feedback on how your your son how your black son is doing um Mm -hmm. uh, at school it's important it's important for the child to hear it and understand that as well you touched on a couple of things you always talk openly about how ill you became and Mm -hmm. um, I I wanted to know how important was your faith during that period of time? Without my faith I'd probably be dead and I say no qualms about it. With my faith and, and my favorite scripture is with Christ all things are possible. For me what I suffered I had pneumonia where I nearly died, I had a heart attack, I had heart surgery, I had, well, quadruple bypass heart surgery. Then I was diagnosed with cancer and then had to have a colectomy. And then when the cancer had spread, I ended up with chemotherapy. So with all those things and all those journeys, you know, I mean, I couldn't have got through it by myself. I have an amazing family. I have an amazing mum. I have an amazing, you know, support network. But also I have an amazing church as well. And I remember in each of those situations, I had a scripture, I had a verse that I could hold on to, to get through the next day, you know, and I remember even with the cancer, after having heart surgery, the heart surgery didn't really matter so much to me, but cancer was something that was in my family. And I lost my grandmother through cancer, I'd lost uncles through cancer. So having been diagnosed with that, it was like a rock at my head. But I remember someone, a friend of mine saying to me, the scripture, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. And I held on to that through each chemotherapy session, through all the dark times and stuff like that. But I think I remember when my grandmother, who was a Pentecostal minister, when she was dying, I remember her saying to me, her work was done. And I used to read the word for today for her with, with her by her bedside each morning. And then one morning she said, my work is done. She lived by that whole mantra or that song, if I can help somebody as I walk along, then my living was not in vain. And she was a servant leader. And all through my illnesses, I never got to the point where I felt my work was done. I still felt there was things for me to still do, which is where the publishing company came in. Again, being a, a granddaughter or coming from a family of servant leaders, it was important that what I did was serve because that's all we know how to do. And that's where we get our satisfaction. I mean, if I can just hold you there, because we are going to get to Blackjack Media, but what came first? Did the publishing company come first or did the book that your son wrote about um, you not being well come first? Yeah, so the book um, Life Without My Mummy was the first book that our publishing company published. And that came first because that was a way for him to heal with me having the illness that I had. So my son was five at the time when I had the heart attack. He was six when I had the heart surgery and he was seven when he went to play therapy and would come home and write down his thoughts and feelings. And his thoughts and feelings, my daughter was saying, let's put it in a book, mum, let's put it in a book. When I was younger, I always wanted to write a book. I was creative, I'm an English teacher. And anytime I had any ideas and I'd write them down and send them off to Penguin or Heinemann, there was always a rejection. And it was only after publishing my son's books, I said, if we're gonna do it, we'll do it properly. We're gonna get him a barcode, we're gonna get it in Waterstones, we're gonna do this, do that, whatever. It wasn't as easy as that, but we did all the things that we needed to do through research. And then when his book came out, we went to our local bookshops, one in Stoke Newton, one in London Fields, one in Clapton or whatever. And somebody had read the book and, nominated him for an award called a true little hero award for scribe of the year and we got notification that he was nominated and then we got there and he won oh, and wow. the self-esteem the boost that it gave a seven-year-old who was right low because his mum was he thought was dying gave him that kind of impetus and the confidence that I was just shocked at seeing and it's like wow And so every year we decided that we would do a book with him every summer holidays. So his first book came out. Then his second book was his guide to London architecture because he loved Lego. 
His third book was his guide to free London because his sister used to take him to all these places in London where you go to free. And then the third book, I was inspired by my year eight boys. I was worried about them. They didn't care. You know, they couldn't be bothered with what people thought about them. And I had them in detention all the time. And I, I remember sitting with one of them and saying to them, when you look in the mirror, what do you see as a black boy? What do you see? And he was like, oh, I, I don't know, miss. I said, you need to see greatness. And we went through this whole scenario of, of if you could see confidence, who would be that person or whatever? And that ended up being my son's second award-winning book, Hey Black Boy. And it was only after we published that and he won another award, I said before, someone came up to me and said to me, well, where's Hey Black Girl? All the books we'd done had been with my son because it was his journey that we were working on. And I thought, oh, Hey Black Girl? And it was like, oh, which meant I would have to work with somebody else. And that was when the publishing company actually started because then it was working with people outside of my family. And the young little girl, Brianna, which is, was Basil Mead's granddaughter, she won an award for her book, you know, and ended up with an Instagram account. And I was like, really? You know, and she was third of three children, very shy, very introvert. And her mum said that she's never seen well, she's, she's seen now a massive difference in her character, in her confidence. And I kept saying to myself, there's something here. There's something here. And post Hey Black Girl, we've published 21 books. You know, right. we've worked with about 42 young authors. And that confidence effect, that self-esteem effect is what keeps us going and what keeps us buzzing. Over the pandemic, we worked with 25 authors who interviewed their grandparents. And yeah, I've got a book here. It's called um, A our COVID-19 route. Project, Our Roots, The Inspiring Stories of Our Grandparents and Great-Grandparents. Um, and I think it's a bit sticky. It's because it's been gifted to somebody. So thank you for sending that uh, to me. Well, but tell me what, in, was it, what it was like working on that project. It was amazing because it really showed me that I can work with children from all over the world without having to move out of my space. So normally when we were working, I was doing book projects, I would hire a computer suite in a library or in a school, and I would do a project with them. And then it was back and forwards. When COVID came, I was able to work with children from Manchester, children from Northampton, children from one, one of them is from Zimbabwe. So I was able to work with 25 children in one space on a project. Writing about their grandparents was important to me because it was legacy. And the stories that came out were amazing. A lot of them who came from the Caribbean, you know, loved it in the Caribbean. They were happy. They had nothing and they were happy. They played with sticks. They made things with elastic bands and stuff. They were happy. You know, they came over here. One grandparent said that how when she looked and didn't see no, no fruit trees and felt the cold, she told her mum she left her pyjamas back in Jamaica. Can she go home? One of the grandparents the great-grandparents actually died three days after she was interviewed. But her legacy lives on. I mean, when I read her story, her father cut the wood that made the first New Testament Church of God in Jamaica. You know, that's legacy. One of her daughters was in the group Boney M that sang Mary's Boy Child. And and she was a singer, the mum herself. So her family was so happy that even though she had died, her legacy lived on. And and I think that's what we've ended up with Blackjack Media being, a book company that deals with legacy, stories of the Caribbean, you know, stories of, of, that may have be health issues, you know, which unfortunately have been mine, but other Black people are experiencing. It's not, these are not white diseases. You know what I mean? There is, we are dying from cancer we are dying from heart surgery you know so so we try to tell the stories of our ancestors as well as us and as well as staying black I mean we only work with black children up to the age of 15 but not because we only work with black children I want to see the the difference that being an author makes to a black child I want to see them writing about their experience and embracing that so one of our last books that we wrote, a young child wrote, was about alopecia. And um, this yes. is a young girl who's got alopecia and has to live with it. And I remember having chemotherapy and having to live with having no hair, having to live to being bored and how ugly I felt, how, how low I felt. 
much less somebody having to experience that in a different way. And they're six, seven years old. So watching the progression of little Delena, who wrote, I am not my here, you know, her mom had given her this mantra for her to hold on to, to say, I am smart, I am beautiful, I am brave. And that's what she would say when people were nasty to her or what she'd say when she felt sad and low. She now has her own Instagram page, which is better than mine. She has a website. She's selling books, one called I Am Brave. It's a notebook. One called I Am Beautiful. One called I Am Smart. You know, her mum called me today and said she wants, can she use the images on in the book? Because she wants to make affirmation cards that say mm-hmm. I am. I, and just seeing this little child, you know, blossom with confidence is what it's all about, really. Yeah. Well, you answered my next question. I was going to ask you, how many books have you published so far? You mm-hmm. said 21. But what are your other book aspirations or what other projects do you have happening this year? Yeah, for this so 2022, we're working on a book tour. There's three things, a couple of things we're working on. We're working on a book tour where we want the children to be able to talk about their books and, you know, sell their books and make money. So what I do with the children with this with Blackjack Media is those who write the books can get the books at cost, right? So they can make a profit from selling their books to their circles. They can't sell it on websites and stuff like that, but to their circles, they can make money. And I know one kid's got 300 pounds in their bank account just from their book alone. Because I want to show them that it's a business as well as a skill and as well as something to be proud of. So we want to take these children on a tour. We were promised by Lord Hastings, who is who is an advocate of what we're doing, that he would take take the children to the House of Lords. But then COVID came and things, things yeah. were different. But now that Boris is saying, you know, COVID don't exist anymore, we're pushing for the House of Lords. So we're doing, we're doing that. We also, we've been working on getting a good distribution deal for the books. We have a pop-up stall, where we, which we have in Hackney, that we sell on a weekly basis our books. But we've been liaising and negotiating with WH Smith at the moment so um we now have our books they have our books with a small publisher called gardeners and we now have our books yes. on their website we now are pushing to get the books in the shops and i've i've negotiated three shops to start with let's see how it goes if we don't sell then fine but we will sell so we're looking at that and then we'll have a big campaign about that trying to get people to go w H smith because we want them i want the children to see their books in a real bookshop if that makes sense. I mean, um, the local shops are, are real, but in, until we as small publishers get those deals with Waterstones, I mean, Waterstones will call me and say to me, oh, someone's come in for, for your book, can we have five? And I'm saying, no, we want to put your, our books in your shops. Why are you just ringing me up for five copies? Do you know what I mean? People are, you know, stop that. So we don't want to play that game with them. We want our books. We can get our books out there, but we want our books out there on the mass. I want the children to walk past a shop and see their book in the window. Wow. What would that be for them? I mean, part of our marketing campaign has always been that when we get a book out, we would put a a big poster up of the child. But financially, that's been an issue. So I'm actually even considering moving the company over to charitable status so that we can get grants. And then do that because every book that we published out of the 20 odd books that we've had, I've paid for myself. I've paid for out of my pocket and I haven't even recouped that back. But there are other benefits. Bearing in mind, my son is now finishing his eighth book. Do you know what I mean? He's written eight books. So just that alone and him having grown up with a bit of confidence and with feeling good about himself is worth every penny that I've spent on the company. And I've had other people who have invested in the company to to see these children shine. So really our our next step is either to move to charitable status so we can do the things that we wanna do. Can you imagine having this author's big poster, you know, in their borough and they're walking to the supermarket and they're looking at themselves with their book in their hand? That is what I wanna see. And I think that when we show our children in the light that they should be, then they follow that trajectory, do you understand? If we're gonna say, oh yeah, all that out on road, stabbing people and da 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 and whatever, whatever, then it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm not on that rubbish. Do you know what I mean? I've worked 20 years in education. I've seen amazing children. And we worked on the premise that positivity and achievement was the norm. So if you weren't achieving, you were outside of that norm. 
So you had to fix up. Do you know what I mean? I've been there, I've done that. I've got the heart surgery and got the cancer and everything else for my labor. Do you know what I mean? But all good because you know what? God has kept me for a time like this to move on to a next stage, basically. Well, I am confident that whatever you sow today, you will reap back a thousandfold. So mm-hmm. all what you are sowing into these children now, you will reap back at some in some shape or some form. So I hope that your publishing house continues to be blessed in that, you know, that that way, because I didn't realize that you were meeting the costs, you know, the printing costs, the cost to do the covers and so on. I didn't realize that that was down to that down to down to you. So I'm hoping that, you know, in this lifetime, you will see those blessings Thank come you. back to you. I've been blessed already, Pamela. Pamela, for for having the illnesses that I've had and to be able to move out of a job that had was 24-7, you know, it was crazy, that I loved, but still being able to work with children and, and stuff and help and support. And there's nothing better than actually seeing a child see their book for the first time. You know, you know what it's like when you yes. open that envelope and you saw Loving the Brothers. For me, I mean, the biggest cost for me is the illustrators because it's that type of book. Anything of else I can do. I can teach the court children. We can brainstorm ideas. We can, I can edit their work. I can do whatever. I can't draw the pictures. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And in quite a few of those books, the most recent book, my recent book that I did, because obviously I said to myself, you can't be a publisher and you ain't publishing no book yourself. You know what I mean? But even my latest book, which because I've done two children's books, the illustrator, her name was Malika, Malika Zanea Grant, she, Andrew Muhammad's daughter. She took my story of Craven and Yamin Jankro and she brought him to life. When he flew to Barbados to eat flying fish and cuckoo, when he went to Jamaica to eat ackee and saltfish, because I'm again still trying to do this heritage thing and whatever. Mm-hmm. And with that book, Craven and Yamin Jankro, it was about a little bird, it was a Jankro that flew to 10 different Caribbean islands to eat their national dish. And the children would learn the island, the capital of that island, and what is the food that they ate. And I had the idea in my head, I'd written it, and it took ages, I wanted it to rhyme. And then, you know, Andrew had directed me to her to help her with her book. She was writing a book. And when I saw her images, I thought, that's my illustrator. So she illustrated my book and it was amazing. And even from that book, I said to myself, do you know what? The next books are going to be this Jankra in each different island, one book for each island, so we can get a feel of what this island is like. So if it is Barbados, we we know what the people are like. We know, you know, the the places, you know, we know about the prime minister, you know. So this bird is going to be able to tell a story. So if we go to St. Vincent, that volcano may erupt and the story behind that may be told. So people get a feel of what these islands are like. Because, you know, Barbados was just Barbados, Barbados, until I came here and everybody says, good morning, good morning. It's like, <laughs> I'm polite, but everybody yeah. says good morning. Do you know what I mean? Very true. You know, I haven't eaten chicken in England after I ate chicken in Barbados. I came over here, you see the chickens crowing in the mornings and you look in the, in the supermarkets and they look a bit scrawny. And I'm saying, why do chickens look so scrawny? And I'm thinking, that's what the chickens look like. So what the hell am I eating in the, in the UK? Do you, do you understand? I've never eaten fish yeah. so much in my life. So there are things that people can still learn and I want them to feel through books, but children to feel these things. Oh, well, Juliet, when are those books likely to be published then? Well, Craven and Yamin Jankro is published. So that's out. Okay. That came out over Christmas. I'll get one of my family's poster copy. That's out. But each year, if I do a book a year, I will focus on one of those islands that that Jankro went to. And there are 10 islands. But I will work with somebody who has um, heritage in that island who will be able to open up the the vision of that island more to me. Wonderful. So tell us about 39 Weeks, Life Behind the School Gates. (laughs) Okay, so as a teacher, every day, you know, you go out with your friends, they say, oh, how was school? And you've got a story about the kids, about their parents, about school life, basically. And when I, when I ended up, I finished my tenure as head of year. So I was with this group for five years. And this is the group that I had lots of stories about. because I'm always meeting parents, always telling them off. 
you know, celebrating successes, blah, blah, blah. And when they left, I had them for five years. They were like my kids. I bored and bored and bored and bored and just thought I'd never be able to do anything again after they were gone. The school had the first ever graduation and prom, you know, that never had prom before we, before I had these kids. I said, we're going to do a prom. We're going to do this. They were great. And there were ups and downs. It was a soundtrack to my life, basically. And I was in school. Sadly, I'm embarrassed to say I was in school more. I was with the school children more than I was with my own kids, basically, because that's what happens when you're a teacher. Anyway, after they left, I thought, I'm going to write about them and some stories and whatever. And I started writing and then I stopped. Then I had the heart attack and I was due to have heart surgery. And I thought to myself, oh, God, I've got to get my book out there. If I die on the table, they've got to re- I've got to have my book, get my book. So I started back in writing it. And then I had the, uh, the heart surgery, thought I wasn't going to go back to school. And the head came around my house and said, you have to come back, you have to come back. And I was saying, no, I'm not coming back. You know, this job is killing me. And then he offered me more money, less time or whatever. And I thought, all right then. But then you end up back in the whole kind of thing. And then five years later, when I was diagnosed with bowel cancer, I thought, no, this has to be it. So I, um, when I, just before my operation, I sat and I finished the book. And I'm finishing this book. And it is about life behind the school gates. And it's a real story. It it does cover things like the heart surgery, which the chapter called Dying to Make a Difference. Because even when I was due to have the heart surgery, it was a time that the year 11 was about to have their exams. And I told the surgeon, no, can you make it two weeks later? Because I've got to see my year 11 through their exams. My family was furious. But when Mm. you are invested in something, that's the way it goes. And it, it kind of like, a Windrush. I'm a child of the Windrush generation. I'm a child of my grandparents. I remember growing up and, you know, just little things like when the ice cream man came, we'd shout, the white people, white kids would shout out, mom, ice cream. But we couldn't shout that because we had Tupperware ice lollies in the freezer. So just little things about memories that I remember about me growing up, because I'll tell you something, my Christian upbringing actually saved me. I realized it saved me when I saw what lives these children were living. Obviously, I tried to make things better for them. And it was important that I did that, which is why people, the kids remember me, because I didn't want them to have anything less than they deserved. And I fought for different things for them, you know, and things like my virginity growing up in the church was something that I valued. I wasn't allowed to have sex until I was married. Do you know what I mean? And when I came into school, and I had to refer a 12 year old for a HIV test. It was a shock. You know, yeah. when, when I first came into school, the young boys would hug me and say, love you, miss, da, 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 da. and I'd hug them back, not realizing they've all had sex. I had big breasts. They're hugging me up. It's like, step back, step back, you know, do not come any closer. So it was a baptism of fire for me, really. And maybe the naivety of growing up in the church and everything is great. And, Grew up in a family where we always ate meat and two veg, even though we struggled, we always had a decent meal, you know, or whatever. And never, I remember once, one of the stories, my mum, we were on free school meals and there was a trip in the first year to go to um, Wales. And I thought, oh, I'm going to Wales, I'm going to Wales, I'm going to Wales. And um, it was £1.50 if you're on free school meals. So I'm going to Wales. And when I came home and told my mum, she said, I can't go. I said, why can't I go? She goes, because I've got to get you new clothes, new underclothes, new this, new that. And it was like, I didn't understand. It was important that I had new pajamas, new this, new that. You know, Caribbean parents are strict. We had certain church clothes we wore for church and certain That's clothes right. we wore outside. We didn't, we didn't mix those two. You understand? No. So I understood that as I was growing. They say, mum, why are you not so long? Child, you are growing, you'll see. You know what I mean? Because, and those are things. And under each episode, it's 39 weeks, because it's 39 weeks in the academic year. And it's 39 episodes. And under each episode, I use a Caribbean saying that we have, those who care here must feel. If you're not mm-hmm. sick, mummy, you see granny or whatever. All these Caribbean, one, one coconut, fill a basket. That kind of describes or sums up the chapters for me. So yeah, I'm proud of this book because it's a legacy. Even more so because it's been um, taken up as an option to be a film, a Black British film. However, at the moment, I've not been happy with the screenplay. And it's nice to say, oh, your book's going to be a film. Oh, it's going to be great. But if it's not right and it don't sit right, then as far as I'm concerned, we can't move forward on this. So I, it's still at, I've had four scripts, four screen, screenplay scripts, and they haven't been right. One, they've had my grandma in there as an American evangelist preaching on the TV. And I'm saying, she's Windrush. 
she's humble that can't work so I'm having battles to the point where I've actually considering maybe even just writing it myself but that takes time not where my expertise is so I'd have somebody else in and whatever but I'm not prepared to move it forward without the script being right the story being right because it's a Windrush story it's a story that has links with Christianity as well as a story about being a teacher because all the decisions that are made in here and the things that I do right and wrong is because of my bring up seat and stuff. I did record last year, I did record some episodes that are from the book. It's a difficult book to make into a film, but we pray. While I'm here, it's a great opportunity, but my focus is on Blackjack at the moment. We've also just done, we're in production doing the prototype for a Christian a Bible board game. We've got a Bible board game called The Living Word Game. And it's, um, you go on a journey from Genesis to Revelations, you answer questions, and it might be scripture, what's the scripture, what's the chapter, what's the verse, and get extra points. And then you go backwards, if, you know, on certain spots, you know, Christ was crucified, go back three spaces. So um, we're excited about that being launched next year. So that's exciting and stuff. Oh, but- absolutely. It's some exciting times. But before we move on, are you able to read a little bit from your book? All right. Okay. I'm going to be back to the early days when I first started teaching. Okay. So this is episode two, week beginning, 11th September, the early days. My early days as a new teacher was a massive learning curve. I lie. At times, it felt like a baptism of fire. The 14-year-old boys sported low batty trousers, outgrown jumpers, were twice my size and would stand by my classroom door as I entered, grinning widely, begging to carry my books with their awkward, broken voices or would enthusiastically yell, you're right, miss. I would try and disguise my nerves and gaze up at the five foot 10 teens, scuttle to my desk and reply in my best teacher voice, good morning. The hip language of my school days may well have been Latin because the new school street talk had significantly changed. For me, a student of the eighties, the vibe was safe, bad, wicked and hard. For them, it was nang, piff, and clapped. Even now, it's all systems change with lit, spice, and muggy. Now you tell me, with their wide vocabulary and unique writing skills, I'm surprised street is not a modern foreign language. How is it these kids can get a good GCSE grade, or can't get a good GCSE grade in French or Spanish, but they can learn street code from scratch? And in double quick time, it's beyond me. It's a skill to text talk or DM. So much so, my son can blatantly leave his Snapchat open, knowing full well that I can't read or understand a word, apart from the basics. CBA, can't be asked. WUU2, what are you up to? PAW, parents are watching. And LMFAO, laughing my, oh, never mind. Being a class tutor for the first time was an amazing experience. All new teachers dream of being given their own tutor group of 28 11 year olds where you can support, shape and bond with. I was thrown in the deep end and given a group of 14 year olds in my rookie year. My role was primarily caretaker for the group whose teacher had been on long-term sick leave. It was awkward. I wasn't their real tutor so they could play up knowing I wouldn't be there for long. They were a nice bunch and I was shocked to discover that their tutor was not likely to return. She'd been out of school for six months had been diagnosed with a terminal illness. It didn't sit well with me knowing she'd been with them close to four years and spent time daily with these students. At some point, she would die and they wouldn't be prepared. I pleaded with senior management to somehow inform them gently, but my request fell on deaf ears. I decided to take matters into my own hands and work with the group during registration to create a book for her. I got each student to contribute a page of writing and design. They each wrote her a letter letting her know how they were doing individually, and I took photographs to go with their texts. We received a beautiful note of thanks from her partner days after we sent the book, saying Miss Mack had cried buckets and loved the gesture. Fortnight later, I was breaking the news to the group that she had died. I was so glad they'd be given the chance to talk to her via their letters, for most to ease the grieving process. And from then on, they became my group, my babies, and the bonding process began. In the beginning, the girls were cautious of me. Who's this young black teacher? I would get in early retreats and create a space for them to chat 
and laughed as I supported with homework. The boys were slightly easy to crack. They would each greet me with a massive hug each morning and tell me how they loved me being their tutor. I felt well and truly blessed. After a PSHE session, Sean Allen asked if we could have a chat. He sat at my desk and blurted out, I think I've got gonorrhea, miss. I chuckled. His face became serious. It's not funny, miss. I really do. I continued to smile and explained. The reason I'm laughing is because you've misunderstood what was taught this morning. You can't have gonorrhea. It's a sexually transmitted disease. You can only contract that if you're having sex, I reassured him. I know, miss, he snapped back. I'm not that silly. He then began to accurately describe his symptoms. But you're only 14, I responded in shock. Come off it, miss, he laughed. What's that got to do with anything? I was gobsmacked. I went to see the head of the year, Mr. Guide. But they're only 14, sir, I repeated. They're babies. They hang out in my room in the mornings. They give me big hugs. I paused. I looked down at my double D chest and froze. Oh my God. They hug me every morning. All of them. Oh my God. Oh my. Sean Allen did me a massive favour. From that day on, the darling 14-year-old boys in my tutor group remained confused as to why our morning greeting was now a handshake. Oh my God. And then it goes Oh, on. wow. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for reading that as well. And you read it with so much passion as well. And you also did an, off, an audio book for, yeah, for the book I as did. well, 39 Weeks. Yeah, what was that mm-hmm. experience like? Yeah, I mean, Nikki Brown, again, my good friend and helper, um, he's got a studio and he said he'll do it in his studio. So it was, it was okay, it was fine. A lot of reading over and reading over and reading over, but um, it was absolutely fine. I mean, obviously, when I hear it back, it's like, oh, God, it's my voice. But, um, yeah, it was good, a good experience. And it's also, I realised that since I did the audiobook, a lot of the books that I've downloaded have been audiobooks. So when I'm washing up, when I'm, you know, doing cleaning or ironing or whatever, I can read. So I'm reading more books now, (laughs) audio wise and I only say that that's good for adults not for children obviously because they need to read I'm reading so much more books audially you know because you just never have the time to sit down and do what you need to do I mean every evening one of the things my son even now I'm in Barbados he's actually in London he didn't want to come this time around he wanted to go to school so my daughter's looking after him and Every evening he has to meet, we, we choose a book or he chooses the book and every evening he has to read to me at least two chapters. So I'm blessed to have the audio book experience where I'm listening, reading books that I've wanted to read, be it Gabrielle Union or whoever else. What's the sad thing about self-published authors is because of the expense of audio books, we don't have a lot of them that are their books that are audio because then I'd get through much more by when I'm doing stuff playing. But with my son, there are certain things, books that I want to read, but he can read and, and right. I get to experience that by him reading it to me. So he's done the Akala book. He's done the Trevor Noah book. He's on at the moment, Black and British. That's hard to absorb when someone's reading it to you because all dates and stuff like that. So he has to, after he reads it, summarise it. And then the next day. So today he's summarising the chapter he read to me yesterday. And then tomorrow he will read me the summary and also read more on. So I'm getting an experience where I'd stopped reading for quite a long time for pleasure. I'd had to, as a teacher, English teacher, read Shakespeare, read this text, read that text, read poetry. Now I'm back into enjoying books again through via audio books and also via my son reading me books, reading to Lovely. me. You know, so that's quite yeah. nice. That's I mean, love me, love my audio books. And I set myself a challenge last year of reading 100 books. And that was a mixture of audio books, some, you know, hardbacks that I had here. And, you know, that's why I was able to get to, I think it was 98 books. Um, Two of the other books had not yet come out, um, but I was uh, honoured to get an advanced reader copy. One of them is Joy's book, Travelling with Self. J-O-I. Yeah, I've got to. Oh, my um, gosh. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, so that was wonderful to be able to get to read those books before they came mm. out as well. So I'm very much an advocate of doing audio books because you can do other things alongside 
listening to those books as well. Absolutely. And I think it's Absolutely. a wonderful idea about how you say connected with your son through books as well. So mm. it might be something mm. that I might adopt as well. So thank you for yeah. that. And obviously, the more he reads, the more his vocabulary is extended and the more that he can understand stuff. And being in this Britain as it is today, post George Floyd, there are a lot of things that our boys are experiencing but still don't know about and stuff. So it was also also getting a chance to hear it from different people's perspectives. There's loads of autobiographies out there as well. But, you know, Windrush, you know, he did the, he read the Windrush book, the Windrush scandal and stuff. And we were able to have conversations about that. And when he watches the news or he doesn't sit and watch the news, but when he hears what's going on, he can have an understanding of what that is and what that is. So when... When I used to teach, I mean, I used to get the, the bottom sets and usually they were the naughty, naughty boys, which were black boys. And it was primarily a, a, a heavily black school. And one of the things that I used to do with them is I used to every lesson before the lesson started, we do an, every week, actually, we do a news quiz. And it would be things that happen on the news today. Da, da, da. And they had to actively watch or listen, because if, if they come and can't answer Miss Coley's question, boy, they're with Miss Coley at break time and lunchtime or whatever. Mm. And then we'd show clips of things and stuff like that. I think, you know, Grenfell had happened when I had one of my classes. And I think Ben Ockrey had written a poem about the tower, you know, and how it was like matchboxes and stuff like that and whatever. And we were able to discuss stuff like that. The Rashan Charles case. We had a big discussion because that happened in Hackney. And, you know, I, I, in the book, I write about my experience with that, the, those particular boys and the Rashan Charles case and them saying that nothing's going to happen, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's fixed and whatever. You know, you're not going to get justice. And I, I was adamant that we were going to get justice because there was CCTV. And then as the story started to unfold and it went to the inquest and, and they found that no one was going to be prosecuted for it, I was gutted that because I had to face these boys and it was fortunate that well for, not fortunate but for me it was fortunate because they went on study leave when the verdict came in and I just felt gutted for them even when I got them to write how they were feeling about their experiences I got to understand a bit more about what it was like to be young black and in Tottenham and that's why I would fight for them that's why I would put out the time for them to experience or their cultural capital to be widened so they could experience different experiences, be it going to a ballet or be it going to a comedy club so that they could be able to make judgments and read stuff to them so that they could have conversations, have conversations that they would understand what was going on or be that they're part of this kind of thing. And that's what I've done with my son. Thank you for all of that. And I knew this would happen. I knew that an hour would pass so quickly and I still didn't get the opportunity to ask you all of the questions that I wanted to ask you. I wanted to touch on your awards because I know that you are recently <laughs> in recipient of um, a new award. All I can say is congratulations to you. Um, mm. I think we need to do a part two at some stage. No man is an island. So whatever award I've received, you know, I've had brilliant people are working alongside me with me supporting me and stuff so it's thanks to them it's a community effort and hopefully you know these awards will go towards helping the publishing company get recognized and being able to get funding and stuff like that so for me that's what's important when it comes to this stuff it's important for my children because I've spent a lot of time away from my children. Do you know what I mean? Doing what I do. Now I'm retired. I can spend more time with my children, as it were. But throughout this interview, you have recognised other people. You've talked about Marcia um, Dixon. You've talked about Andrew Mohammed. You know, you've talked about Basil Mead's granddaughter. You know, you've mentioned Nikki Brown. people. people. <laughs> Nikki Brown, of your helper, as you called him, yeah. um, John Francis. So, you know, and these are names that I've heard, you know, over the last 40 years in and out of the church as well for the, the, you know, the great things that they are doing. But I wanted to say thank you, Juliet. You are an author that is an inspiration with your book. You know, I see your book. You know, on a beach, I see your book on a coffee table. I see it, it's inspiring. If I had the energy <laughs> at the time, I would follow your footsteps. I actually did a lot on my book last year. I tried to do the readings. I tried to do this and do that and whatever. Yes. You are consistent in what you do. You know, I pray blessings on your loving the sisters. I think someone else said loving the what? It was something else, loving the something I read recently. 
loving the grandchildren, whatever. Do you know what I mean? It has the possibilities to be amazing. And I'm inspired. I came into this industry knowing nothing, you know what I mean? And doing it a different way in the way that I felt would be, would be right. And I've watched people and been encouraged by people who I thought might, well, in, in normal situations would block you. So people like Danny Blechner, people like Winsome and whatever have be, always been open. And it's unusual for me that I'm in an industry with other people and they're not thinking, hey, come, hey, hey I don't want you to you know, step on my vibe and whatever else it is. So I've been blessed to have met people in this space, McConan, you know, or whatever, who have that's right. you know, always wanted to support. So I think that's amazing. And I, I'm, I'm blessed to have come out of one career and moved into this and not had so many so much difficulties but a lot of encouragement so I thank you for all your support all your positive comments they mean so much so bless you and bless what you're doing yeah thank you please do keep in touch and let me know how it's going and um, no doubt our paths will cross again soon so thank you very much and goodbye for now goodbye thank you It's competition time now. Can you answer the following question? Juliet Coley starred in the hit gospel show, People Get Ready. Who was her co-host? To enter the competition, go to Instagram and follow me at Loving the Brothers Author. Send me a direct message with the correct answer for your opportunity to win her book. Have a good week now and bye for now. Please join Pamela R. Haynes for another author to author podcast coming soon.